again folks who was part of the body shame podcast i am delighted to be joined with mel who i cannot pronounce her surname so hello mel and can you pronounce your surname please that's right nobody can pronounce it it's chavuco chavuco yes fabulous are you okay to share uh, just to introduce yourself mel just to say whatever you want to say as an introduction if that's okay yeah, yeah, great. Um, well, yeah, thank you for having me here. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm an integrative counsellor. I just set up in private practice this year. So I work part time in private practice and I work part time for a domestic abuse agency. I work with perpetrators of abuse. In my private practice, I work with mostly like eating disorders, disordered eating, body image, weight stigma related things. And I've worked in that sort of field for eating disorder charities for way before I I trained to be a counsellor actually probably over seven or eight years now um, and I'm very very passionate about um, about all things to do with food and eating and body distress because I think it's so widespread. Absolutely Mel. How Mel came to my attention was I came across a fantastic article in the BACP magazine that's the British Association of Counsellors and Psychotherapists uh, for those who might not be aware and as counsellors, we get this monthly magazine and I came across Mel's article. Wow, I was blown away by it. And the whole thing of fat shaming, body shaming, thin shaming, I mean, there's just so much of it and stuff that we need to, to speak about. And I suppose my first question to you, Melly, in your opinion, this whole kind of body shaming, and we'll, we'll say fat shaming, you know, uh, for, for this call, because I was speaking about tin shaming earlier on in the week, um, is that why do you think people body shame in the first place anyway? Ah, body shame each other, I guess. Is that what we get? Because people, I suppose, is also internal. I shame people in turn will 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 shame themselves for it which is a whole thing tied into self-worth i think it's probably t the roots of it are definitely in self-worth for everyone to be honest on a personal level um obviously we live in a society that tells us that thin is better fat is not fat people are responsible they should lose weight diet culture blah 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 makes a lot of people a lot of money doesn't it basically <laughs> the pursuit oh. of thinness <laughs> makes a lot of people a lot of money so it does. Man, let me quote uh, from your own article when i absolutely loved i underlined this um i thought it was brilliant when you were saying in your article that the food industry spends millions encouraging us to eat more processed food than ever while the diet and fitness industry tells us to lose weight. This push-pull keeps many people stuck in cycles of guilt and shame, while their weight fluctuates with the anxieties and health implications that may come with that. Yeah, yeah. There we go. And and how that leads to disordered eating, eating disorders and getting out of that cycle is really hard. And it is. It's a shame cycle. Um, and I think that's where people can get very stuck. And that's what diet culture thrives off. That's what these industries thrive off, because we feel ashamed about ourselves. We never blame the diets, never the diet's fault, even though there's loads of them. Um, it's always our own fault. And then we're thrown back into the I've got to do something about this again. I'm not I'm not happy. It's also it, for people, it can seem like a very tangible thing to change. Um, so when people feel out of control in their lives, thinking about something to do with your body, I can change this just to get into those genes, yeah. feels like something that is actually like tangible um, when people feel out of control in other aspects. And a lot to do with eating disorders and body image stuff is about um, a lack of control, feeling out of control and powerless. Yeah, absolutely, Mel. Um, you know, you've highlighted that point about that for some people, um, they, you know, use their bodies as a form of control if their life feels out of control themselves. Obviously, that's not to say that everybody is the same. Um, I love the idea of people owning their bodies, whatever shape or size they are. Like my, myself, Mel, I do uh, mental health theatre shows. I've been doing them for the last eight years. And my background is in stand-up comedy. So I combined uh, comedy with mental health to show how none of us are normal. 
But I love a uh, kind of modeling the behavior of like me being a plus size 18 to 20 and really rocking it like I, I wore this jumpsuit. And to be fair, I looked good in it. I'm going to own it. And I always had this belief that, oh, a jumpsuit, oh, no, you've got to be really thin to get away with wearing that. And I can hear my own judgment, Mel, as I say that. And it was just fabulous to present that to the audience and to be proud of being a size 18, 20, whatever size you are, and just owning it and feeling great as you are. And I remember people afterwards coming down to me saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, that they'd never come across anybody just owning fat and being overweight and not giving a shite. And because I'm very fit, like I exercise an awful lot. And then there's that misunderstanding as well, isn't there? They're just because people are overweight, <laughs> then they're not fit. Exactly. Yeah. So many assumptions and so many rules are necessary. Fat people shouldn't wear this. You shouldn't wear that. Shouldn't wear crop tops. Shouldn't wear. No, I think it's, I, I hope that's changing now. I actually see a lot of younger people. I still sound so old now. I, sound, I see a lot of younger people actually rocking crop tops and all sorts of stuff. So that was always like a terror thing of mine. I would never do that. I, I wouldn't, when I was younger, I didn't even want to wear a swimming costume. It took me quite a long time to do that. And it was only when I was in my twenties and I went traveling and pulled up the courage to go to Australia on my own wow. um, and um, I thought well if I can do that I can wear swimwear because come on went to the other side of the world by myself so I sort of did it and I just did it every single day I was in swimwear every day because I was on the beach and it became a new normal for me and I was like when I was uh, before that I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be anywhere in swimwear I felt so uncomfortable and then I was like now it's just normal now my life is just beach <laughs> you know what good for you Mel and if you don't mind me asking and please say if you do only answer what you're comfortable to answer here Mel is that where did those messages come from for you? Why do you think you had so many hang-ups? And I'm curious about your own experience because I have my own growing up in the west of Ireland. I'm curious about where you were brought up and your own messages around weight and fat and all of that. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy to answer that because it's such a, it, you know, this is this is the work that I do. I do this work because of this. So um, I'm, I'm based in Bristol now, but I grew up in the Midlands. And um, I had, I, I think I just, I can't even really remember when I first got messages that um, being thin was better, being fat was bad, that but you shouldn't wear certain things, that, you know, women eat like this, men eat like that. All the rules that aren't spoken, they're just learnt. Um, and I feel like I just knew them from, from birth because every woman around me seemed to be on a diet. Every man could eat what he wanted. Um, you know, it's not the people around me thought they've grown up in the same culture. Um, everybody on tv was thin and attractive mm. i never would have seen um you know this is why representation representation is so important when i set up instagram i was like right people let's see bigger people in bikinis this is what i want this is yeah. what i need um because it's what i never i never saw that um so yeah it was it was uh diet culture it was um just narratives normalization of stuff uh things in school I, and i know a lot of people have told me a similar story to this but being weighed at school some people yeah. get weighed publicly some people get told your bmi i was told that my bmi was too high and i was a fit kid at that point. i was doing like step aerobics with my mom because it was the 90s and it was cool i was doing like very <laughs> <laughs> mr motivator and all that <laughs> i remember all the doors <laughs> um and then uh and yeah i was doing dance classes and like all sorts and i was like i don't have time to fit in any more exercise like yeah. outside of school um and so i thought i you know the only other option is eat eat less because i was given that whole sort of exercise a bit more and just eat a little bit less which we feel you know is rubbish um and um i, I was just distraught you know i was just like what well, yeah. I, I meant to actually stop eating now then um it that you know led me into lots of disordered eating throughout my life which I never would have even thought it was that until I learned more about this probably more when I was in my 30s um and it didn't really start to change probably until I went traveling in my in my yeah. 20s I think I needed a break from the place um yeah. there was various things in my life yeah. and in my family which were the underpinning stuff of that um which I won't go into but I do think that the culture um 
the the culture of the whole thing and the normalization of like women especially always having to work on their bodies to be smaller in particular um and look a certain way and fit in and dress a certain way and I felt like my body was always under scrutiny yeah constantly. yeah wow man like there's so much in there like thank you for sharing all of that you can definitely see how all of us most of us will have hang-ups around weight at some part of our lives and I just feel like that too much of a big deal is made out of weight and size and all of that like I definitely believe to myself you know that if there wasn't such a big deal but oh you've got puppy fat or oh, don't worry you'll lose it you know from such a young age I never lost a puppy fat I mean I still have I probably have about four or five different puppies that I call Sheila's wheels around my body you know just like that's the thing is the message or oh, you lose that as if there's something wrong with having any weight on, on you and I just think that we worry far too much about having a spare tire or a couple of rolls it's skinned at the end of the day and as well as that like our bodies are amazing you know they're producing kids you know what it can achieve and I remember reading somewhere about really to fall in love with your body and one of the things they recommended was to stand in front of the mirror naked every day and almost force yourself, because for some people it's very difficult to do that, but, but initially to force yourself to, to name at least three or four things that you like about your body, to start changing your thought process and your actual, because our bodies, wow, we live in our body. Why not have our body as our best friend? But to, and take off any expectations. Like, like I was saying, man, I love people owning their bodies. And I find that this may sound full of shite, but regardless of what size I've been in my life, I've never had any problems you know, attracting the opposite sex because I've always been that confident person. You know, yeah, I might have faked it at some time because of all the body shame that I had. But the thing is, is that it does just too much defined on people's size. And it's not about that. It's about your own inner confidence and you can love yourself whatever size you are. Mm -hmm, exactly yeah yeah there's a lot of people in smaller bodies and thinner bodies who really don't like their bodies as well so it says you know it isn't thinness that makes us happy it, thinness doesn't equal health health doesn't even equal being treated better like it you know everyone should have respect health isn't accessible for some people health isn't possible for everyone people have chronic illnesses disabilities all sorts of stuff which means that it's just not possible to look a certain way sometimes or lose yeah. weight you and there's so much emphasis on that sometimes by medical professionals as well sadly it makes a, a big stigma when you've got medical professionals people in power and our government so we go to political um who reinforce these messages and have you know these um strategies to make people lose weight and have this sort of you know war on war on people's bodies i'm avoiding saying like the o words because it can be very dramatic some of the language is very um in it's, language, it's we'd mentioned that just before the call. We had a brief chat about you were saying about owning the word fat and the novel. And I love that idea. Yes, I'm fat, and your problem is because tell someone who gives a shite, basically. But then other language, you say obese, there's something about that. You just, it, it does a bit of, I don't know, it just doesn't sound nice word to me. I think it's because it's based. It's quite. It seems quite stigmatizing by people because of medical weight stigma and people not being able to get the help that they need, and also things being passed off as, "Oh, you have this illness. Have you tried losing weight?" Um, when when they wouldn't say that to a to a thin person, it's very hard to advocate for yourself um, with medical professionals because they do hold quite a lot of power. Um, but yeah, it's based on BMI and BMI. I don't know if you're aware, well, BMI is pretty much bullshit. So um, it's. I hope sorry. <laughs> because <laughs> I think you said so much historically about it <laughs> can you share that bit with the listeners please about BMI yeah it was something <laughs> so your article about um historically about the BMI chart 
Yeah, so the BMI is a great article by Aubrey Gordon, actually, which can explain this in a lot more. Her, or her books or her podcast is amazing. Um, she did a lot of work into looking at the origins of BMI. And it came about in the 1800s and the 1830s. It's so out of date. It was made by somebody who was like a mathematician, astronomer, not made to measure people's weights at all, just to look at population statistics. And wow. he only based it on white European men. It's you. Useless. It's, it's oh, wow. And it's been used wow. to be very stigmatizing for a lot of people. And um, people are just in this box. And then if you're not in the normal healthy little sliver, yeah. and then after that, it's, you know, but it's it's rubbish because there are a lot of people who are over the normal who are perfectly healthy. And you said in terms of yourself, you do a lot of exercise. There's yeah. a lot of people in larger bodies who do lots of exercise. There's a lot of people in smaller bodies who don't do a lot of exercise. Some people can't do exercise. It's just so there's so many assumptions and stigma and, um, you know, and discrimination. I'll say it. I feel it is discrimination. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a more acceptable form of discrimination because it's so normal it's like fine for people to make fat jokes it's fine for people to be like well you know you need to be working on yourself to film people in gyms to shame people to put it on social media like and then it puts the pressure on I guess fat people to have to be what they call the good fatty of like as long as I'm showing that I'm doing something as long as I'm showing I'm in the gym and I'm working on it it's still giving the same message isn't it oh at least you know she's fat but she's in the gym it's just it's still the same thing do you know something men do you think we just need to learn to not give a shite what other people think <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it's a lot harder said than done now I think and I think in my own journey I've always wanted to not care what other people think but I always did because so much of this ties into self-worth and my lack of confidence I lacked confidence yeah. for so long I didn't speak very much when I was a kid I'm making up for it now <laughs> <laughs> never start bloody talking now but like yeah I didn't have that when when I was young because I felt terrified I didn't want to be seen at all and I think some of this meant I didn't have the confidence in myself to not care what other people thought because my validation was based on what everybody else thought of me and I suppose that's what grew over the years when I went traveling when I had lots of therapy mm -hmm. when I learned lots of stuff about body acceptance body positivity when I filled my social media feeds full of people who are different to myself or look very similar to myself people with yeah. my kind of bodies in yeah. bikini something that I was like oh my god I will never be able to wear a bikini and uh, now I go swimming I go I do cold water swimming now and I don't I couldn't I could not care at all what other people think of me because I'm going swimming for me for the benefits to my mental health it's not to lose weight it's not to punish yeah. myself even though people would see cold water is quite a punishment <laughs> I've reframed my relationship with exercise so that I'm not doing it just to try and lose weight I do things for movement and fun I wear purposely I will wear normally if I'm on camera I didn't wear today but I'm usually always wearing sequins when I'm speaking at things yeah. because again I didn't want to be seen and all the work I've done now I'm now I'm like good I'm going to make a damn sure that I'm going to be seen <laughs> <laughs> man I love I'm loving your confidence I'm absolutely loving it uh, where can people find you on social media uh, so, I, well, I've got quite a Googleable name, really, if you know how to spell my surname. <laughs> so my website is actually just meltravuco.com. Okay. And then most of my social media uh, channels, I've got an Instagram and Melchavuco counselling one uh, yeah. Facebook page. But they're all basically under the name Melchavuco. I don't have a different um, counselling name. It's all just under sure. my name. Mel, how do you spell your surname for those listening in? <laughs> it's C I A V U double -C, C O. Lovely, lovely. So, kind of in finishing this off, man, if let's say, okay, we've got people listening in and they're not where we're at, that unfortunately they, they worry far too much about what other people think. And maybe because you mentioned about environments earlier on, and I think that's a massive thing. I think sometimes we're in toxic environments and we don't even realize it. Families that mean well and say the worst judgmental things that kind of adds to the shame and they don't even realize it. But 
if let's say you've got you know girls listening in, blokes listening in, and all that, don't don't body shame themselves. What advice would you give to them? Well, I suppose um from my own experience, um I would say it's not something that can be hurried. I think, you know, go easy on yourself. And if you just sometimes the pressure of body positivity can be a bit like love your body now, go get that bikini on. <laughs> if you can't do it for me, I was like, that's just way too much of a jump. It's not reasonable. Yeah, it so it's okay where where you're at. Um, yeah. you don't have to go, you know, stand in the front of the mirror naked. I've done that, that was tough. Um, it's little steps, you know, some of these are quite big. And I would suggest like it very practical things like changing up your social media and thinking who you're seeing and the impact on you. And having seen diverse bodies and diverse people, that's really important. Um, if you think there's the deeper rooted stuff going on to do with self-worth and confidence, um, and not I, I don't want it to be a, a plug, but literally. I'm biased. I'm a counsellor. Counselling. <laughs> and, and I will completely advocate that. I mean, obviously I'm a counsellor myself. When I went through counselling, I was the client, uh, you know, to, to work out kind of where all these hang-ups were coming from. And it's also external. There's oftentimes we blame ourselves and we think that there's something wrong with us. And even like the whole thing, if it's issues with, with comfort eating, it's okay to comfort eat. And that's the thing, you know, I'm a firm believer of each their own. Like, because for me, I've done all the, the diet clothes, got to tag away, because I'm a very determined woman. If I decide I'm going to do something, I'll do it. But I was never consistent with staying there because what that meant was I couldn't enjoy my food. I had to watch everything. So I kind of decided, yes, I, I, I'm, I really accept being overweight. I'm choosing to be overweight <laughs> and while also be healthy. And I've lost a cake. Woo! So <laughs> it's the own man. Stop everybody exactly. Else. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so much of it is the pressure on yourself, isn't it? Yeah. And I can say building that compassion for yourself, letting yourself off the hook and doing what you'd like to do, just allowing yourself. You know, there's plenty yeah. of stuff out there that you can read and learn about. Probably the, the reading about diet culture and weight stigma and stuff was very important for me. Um, yeah. having counseling if you need it, looking at your social media, um, surrounding yourself with the right people putting in boundaries with family or friends or people who are mentioning weight or in the office or anything lots of lots of stuff that you can do like that but I think the core of it is probably building compassion for yourself I think that is a fantastic way to end Mel thank you so much have you noticed how I still won't try and pronounce your surname <laughs> oh, well. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and I hope people listening in that, that they get something from this and I hope that people are happy to comment uh, this will be my YouTube channel and obviously all the podcasts on Apple and Spotify uh, but, but especially the comments especially on the YouTube channel because it's lovely to hear people's comments and it's all about kind of helping each other so we have our, our two perspectives here but so many people will have stuff that they can pass on and that learning um Mella. yeah things that have been helpful for them like yeah lots of people have read lots of things about body image it could be so that would be great to share uh, absolutely as well yeah um, and that the article that you read that is the BACP one is actually on my website as well just for people who aren't BACP or people who aren't counselors yeah. um it's it's a it's on yeah because otherwise the, that's behind the, the sort of you know BAC website but it's on my it's on my website as well and that's fabulous that people can read that I would highly recommend it Mel thank you so much have a lovely day thank you thank you so much <laughs> thank you for watching counselor convos with Sheila McMahon if you've enjoyed this video consider subscribing to the channel